Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our study this afternoon as we start with a brand new book, uh, the book of First John. Uh, we're going to look at the whole of chapter one today. It's only 10 verses and I believe some really important things for us to discuss today. But let us pray and thank the Lord for this time. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing, as always, of gathering together to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person that is with us. We pray for those who are listening to the recording as well. And we trust that we'll be greatly encouraged, Lord, as we study your word together. Please strengthen us, care for us, and help us, Lord, to, to hear what you have to say today and help us, Lord, to apply it in our lives, to walk faithfully in you. We just thank you, Lord, for this blessed time together. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, so First John chapter 1, I'm just going to read from verse 1 to 10. Um, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I just gave a bit of an introduction in the notes on the book of First John. Um, these epistles of John, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic between doctrinal truth, but it's very personal and also very practical because he speaks to people in very endearing terms. Uh, John would have seen himself as a father figure, the reason why, because of his age Many of the other apostles by this time would have probably been martyred, uh, depending on when this was, was written. Um, so there's a lot of dynamics to when it was written. But as we know, John, of course, wasn't martyred and would see himself as a sort of father figure. Now, when was the epistle written? Um, that's the very interesting part, because generally... With Revelation, people would normally jump to the conclusion that Revelation was written between 90 and 95 AD. Now, I don't know why. I'm, I'm basically going with what people are saying. Now, there are some views that Revelation might have been written earlier. Mm. Now, again, a lot of things in Christianity, I haven't studied myself. I go on what people are saying. And the best advice I can ever give anyone is don't go on what people are saying. <laughs> find out what the truth is yourself because many times we build up ideas because of what people have told us and it might not be true so when we look at first john there are two views it was either written in 90 a.d which is later which is sort of at the time in revelation it's written but the other view that i would sort of go with and, and, and feel that it's, it's more valid is that it was written earlier probably before 70 AD. And the reason why is because there's no real mention in First John of the temple being destroyed, which would have been a big issue. He would have definitely have made mention of that or have sort of lent to that. So it's, it's possible and highly probable that First John was probably written late 60s. So maybe sort of at the time when almost when Peter was being martyred. Paul had, of course, been killed already. So, um, of course, it's not an exact science. It is a view. But based upon what is being said here, we, we don't have anything of the temple being destroyed. 
And I think a lot of the timings that are put in place is because of certain historical dynamics, but we don't have facts exactly to when the books were written. And therefore, we have to maybe look at internal content to find out where this, what the dates might be. So, so therefore, it, it's two views. And basically, I will personally lean to the fact that it was written earlier. And I think even it's possible that Revelation was written earlier than we think. Mm -hmm. um, but those are all sort of scholarly discussions that just beyond my pay grade at this stage. But <laughs> let's look at verse verse one, um, because there's a lot of important aspects to to this chapter for us today to discuss, especially <laughs> from a Christian perspective. Of course, John would have also have written to a Jewish audience. We understand that even the terminology of father and son and children, those are very Jewish concepts. But where he's writing from, the position he's writing from, is different from where Peter was writing from. So I think there's a lot of dynamics here that are very Christian and for us to think through. So let's look at verse 1. And it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now when we read John 1, 1, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And here once again you have the beginning. But as I've said in the notes, that the beginning here is not the same as John 1.1. Because John 1.1 1, 1 is in the beginning was the word. So John 1.1 1, 1 takes us to eternity past. Mm. This is the beginning of when the apostles met Christ. So he says from the beginning of Christ's ministry and the time they spent with him. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So John is trying to say that from the beginning of Christ's ministry and the time that they spent with him, they touched him, they, they, they had physical uh, contact with him. And it's very, very important so that he's writing as, as an eyewitness of the person of Christ. So it's not the same. Um, but as I said in the notes here, the word here uh, from John 1, 1, the same word was heard, was seen, was looked upon, was touched, I put the word touch because that's what handled is in the Greek. It's to touch something physically, the word of life, which is Christ. And the importance of this verse will become clearer throughout the epistle because John strongly writes in all his writings against the Gnostic teaching. Now, to go back into history, the Gnostics taught um, about a higher spiritual knowledge. It, it's similar to what many sort of, of the more charismatic churches are doing where you have to have this spiritual experience or God speaks to you. And, you know, it's not about the word of God now. It's about extra biblical revelation. That's sort of Gnostic in its thinking. Because, of course, the word Gnostic comes from Gnosis, which is to know. But the Gnostics basically taught that there was this higher spiritual knowledge available to people. Because, of course, the word of God at that time the New Testament was being written, so they could say that. And so certain people had this spiritual knowledge, but the problem is what the Gnostics went into now was that they questioned aspects of the person of Christ. The Gnostics especially questioned his humanity, that he, that he sort of was more sort of just, so basically they focused on he was just a, a normal human with the spiritual dynamics to him or this Christ spirit, which what the Hindus speak about as well. So, so the Gnostics believed that Jesus just attained a higher spiritual knowledge. So what they didn't believe in is that he is the God man, that he is fully human and fully God at the same time, which is basically the what is called the hypostatic union, that Christ is fully man, fully God. They always questioned that. So where um, the, the Gnostics would question his humanity and always just focus on the sort of higher divinity and everyone has the ability to be Christ's and have this higher divinity. Uh, John is writing here about the fact that they didn't, wasn't it Christ? If you look at verse 1, we've touched him, we handled him, we saw him. See, so they're focusing on his person, his humanity. So, so the Gnostics were like big even before, Oh, yes. Jesus, yes, yes. was, you know, before his ministry. Yes. No, no, no. So just after. Just after. Oh. During the time of Christ. 
snow after Christ. After Christ. So because then they would look back and say, who was Jesus? Because now he died, he's ascended okay. now. So now he's not there anymore. And then all the doctrine then starts of sort of hypotheses of who he was. And oh. that's when all these things start happening in the church. And that's why John especially writes, and we'll see this throughout yeah. the epistle. He writes an apologetic of we were there at his baptism. It was the water and it was the blood. We touched him. We saw him. So he's trying to drive home the humanity of Christ and his divinity. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. So he really focuses on the two aspects of the the person of Christ. The humanity and the divinity combined drives that home. Because the Gnostics, in one shape or another, would question either divinity, because the Jews would question divinity, yeah, and the Gnostics would question the humanity. Mm-hmm. Now you need both. Unless you have both, you don't have the incarnation. The whole yeah. point of there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, is because you need both divinity and humanity. You can't just have divinity because then he can't relate. There's no identification with us. Also, he can't really then be the kinsman redeemer because mm-hmm. he's not close enough to us yeah. to redeem us you need someone that's close who is yeah. part of the family who has partaken of flesh so it's a very important dynamic the, the 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 reality of what the bible is telling us that jesus was both physical human but also divine and so so john is addressing this both in his gospel as well as this would you say is that the would you say the main thrust of, his of, of, of john chapter one yeah, I was going to say, because certainly John chapter 1 is... Yeah, John like chapter 1 is laying a really, very important really. foundation. The Word became flesh, flesh, and it should settle the argument right? Yeah, of who the Word is. So that's a very important dynamic. And here, as I said, the structure so, here, the, the, first, is... the structure of the first five verses here, as I put in the notes, takes on the similar structure of John chapter 1, but just in a different angle yeah. of, of we've touched him. And that sort of... Why John's doing that is because he's, he's writing about his apostleship. He was there, which is yeah. important. Yeah. And so they can trust his testimony. And I'll, and I'll give you the verse that I, in Peter, well, Peter says the same thing. Let's look at verse 2. It says, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. <laughs> Now, it's important to understand what he is saying. And this is what's so difficult about Western thinking. You don't use these terms unless you are trying to tell us something very important, which is the um, fact that it's eternal life. Christ is eternal. He was with the Father, and he was manifested to us. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So it's what he's trying to say. In Western thinking, we're always trying to draw dichotomies of this is not possible. Of course, it's not possible in our brains. But the Bible is trying to tell us something about the person of Christ. Not to try and reason with you. That's why. I'm not sending Keith a preaching plan of the Trinity. I'm not going to preach on the Trinity because it's a waste of my time. I declare the Trinity, but to try and explain it to people, it's, it's, it's just too much effort of trying to explain a concept. I'm here to say that the Bible says Father, Son, and Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. That's what the Bible declares. I'm declaring to you what the Bible says. To try and explain how that works is just, as I said, above my pay grade. Mm-hmm. Because I can't explain that to people because we can't fathom it. Because mm-hmm. our only concept is I'm born and I die. The only concept we have is of what we know. Mm-hmm. And I can take you back, however ages we are, and we go back to the womb. I can promise you, if I could speak to you in the womb, you would have said, this is wonderful life, isn't it? Because all you know in the womb is the womb. You don't believe there's anything more no. until you are born. Oh, there's something more. Same with heaven. People say, I don't believe in heaven. I don't get it. Of course, you're not going to get it because all you see no. is this. Mm-hmm. And then you die and then your eyes get open to a new reality. So to understand the Trinity, the whole point is it's beyond us. Mm-hmm. But God gives us sprinklings from Genesis chapter 1, Elohim, the Spirit of God, is upon the waters. So there are things that the Bible sprinkles, like the burning bush that the angel, the messenger of God is speaking. The angel, of course, there is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't have to defend the principle. It's there. Mm -hmm. 
So if you want to see it, you can see it. If you don't want to see it, then of course you can go fall back to human philosophy and not get it. And then become a Hindu that believes in three separate gods or whatever you want to believe. Because the reality is that the Bible tells us something. So when we look at this, why is John saying what he's saying? He's saying something very, very important because Jews cannot believe in a God-man. They can't get their heads around. They only believed in the Messiah coming back and setting up the kingdom. But the whole point of the manifestation of Christ is to explain that the Jews didn't read it incorrectly. It's, it's the wrong term, but they didn't understand it. Because, because their concept of the Messiah, then, it's not... God, man, no, no it, it, it's, it's the Messiah just coming as a sort of arm oh, of man. God. But look at what Isaiah says. Isaiah says he is the father. Yeah. You know, so, so that manifestation they needed to see. They struggled with that. How can you call yourself God? That was the whole point of because yeah, the Jews yeah. couldn't get that. They, didn't, they struggled yeah. with that concept. Because unless there's liberation, we're not going to get it. So the whole point is that for us, the Christian message is based upon what has been revealed to us now about the lord jesus christ and the bible gives us very clear pictures here so mm -hmm. the life was manifested now life of course is, is very important because john uses this in the gospel of john as well in him was life mm -hmm. life and that life was the light of men the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us. Now turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. So Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Now again, um, <coughs> the apostles can say these things because they'll say this and then there's credibility to what they say. And how did you trust the apostles? You had to trust the apostles because they performed miracles. Signs and wonders were very mm, important. Yeah. If I stand up in front of the church and I say, no, well, you know, um, God spoke to me last night. How do you know? Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. You basically have to go, oh, Kenneth is, an, uh, Kenneth is a nice guy. I trust him. Says, Please don't do that. You can't yeah. trust anyone. Like but no. the apostles had to say, we were with him. How do I know? Well, yeah. my shadow just went over someone. They got healed. Okay. That, that, and the apostles had to perform the miracles to prove this. So they just manifest, or they just declare this in Scripture. But they, the fact that they're declaring it, there was evidence that backed up this declaration because yeah. they performed miracles. It's not the same as us. Because if it, I don't have to go to people saying, please believe me, I know Jesus. It's, it seems like you're begging. It doesn't matter. But this was important because the authority of Scripture was vested in the credibility of the apostles. Yeah. That's what's so important. If it wasn't for the apostles, how would you have scripture? Yeah. So it was very important that their credibility was, was there in the fact that the miracles were performed. So verse 16 of, of 2 Peter says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So there Peter says the same thing as John does. John says we touched him, we spoke to him, he declared to us. And so Peter says the same, and this is very important. Mm. And that's why apostolic authority is so important, and we have to defend it. Mm. Because people say, how can you trust these people? The whole point is we have to trust them, because if, we, if you can't trust the apostles, you yeah. can't trust Scripture. Yeah. Because the two things cannot be dichotomized. You cannot split between the apostles and the Word of God, because the very Word of God is based on the testimony of these Apostles. And so the first century was easy because the miracles validated. 2,000 years later, it's a lot more difficult for us because now we take it by faith. There's no signs because the apostles aren't here. Mm. Verse 3 goes on to say, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. So interesting what he says. So what we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is declaring this, and those who are hearing these words can then have fellowship because we believe in what is being declared. Mm. Who is the us there then here that he's referring to? The other apostles. Where is that? We've seen her, yeah, we've to you that you also have fellowship with us. 
Yeah, the us is the other apostles. Okay. Because there's, there has to be, these are the guys who are teaching. And the authority is vested yeah. in them. So in their words. So the apostles, what they say, has to be believed. That's why Paul the Apostle defends his apostleship. The 12 have to defend their apostleship. Because without them, there is no teaching. Right. Everything that is being taught. Is... So the prophets spoke. But you still needed the, the apostles to validate generally the, the body of teaching. Yeah. You can't just have prophets on their own. And therefore, the fellowship now is the connection that you have with the word of the apostles. Because the scriptures aren't, aren't written yet. Uh, you just have to go with the, with the word of the apostles. So, so that, and that also is, it emphasizes why even Paul spent time with Jesus in the desert, doesn't it? You know, because yeah. it gives him authority, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. And that's why so so Paul, Paul had a very difficult job. Yeah, yeah. Because he never walked with Jesus. No. Other people knew that these guys walked with Jesus. But that's what the irony is, that he didn't walk with Jesus, but he wrote more, I mean, more than these guys. Yeah, yeah. Because his ministry was so important. I mean, it was individual, I suppose, in that sense. You know what I mean? With, with Jesus. Wasn't yes, it, it was. Like, it was. But it, how do you prove it? Yeah, I know. I mean, you I can literally absolutely. walk around saying, yeah, I'm I mean, in Jesus in the world. It's like, absolutely. So yeah. the way that you prove that is through the miracles. Yeah. That's what Paul said. The signs yeah. of an apostle was walked among you. And then that's, again, why you see how similar to Paul in Acts. As well, is that right? right? You have to have that. Otherwise, yeah. you're not going to be able to validate this. So the fellowship here is the fact that those who are receiving this letter, they did not meet Jesus. They're not touching him. They haven't heard from him. But they have fellowship. Why? Because the experience is the same. Same for us. What John is saying about the Lord Jesus Christ, we have experience and therefore we have fellowship. Mm -hmm. So he's had a very different experience because it was very physical. Just because I wasn't there physically does not mean that I don't have fellowship with the apostles in what they are saying, because I have also met the same Savior, but in a different domain, not yeah. physically yeah. But or spiritually. So he's saying, we're declaring this to you, um, and that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that fellowship is a very important word. It's going to follow through in many of these verses. Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. So um, in the notes I just put you at the end, a true fellowship is when the shared true experience of salvation is there. This is very important. So I was at, at a church in the week, and I was at a service there, and I literally walked in, and once the service started, I had no fellowship. Nothing. There's nothing there. Words are used, scriptures are read, but there's no fellowship. Because it's not no connection no because they don't know the lord jesus christ they don't no. No. and um that's the point is yeah. that when you when someone is is a christian and they're truly a christian you will know yeah then you have fellowship yeah. when someone is not really a christian but talks christian jargon you might struggle a little bit with it which you don't know. Some people, I don't know if they're saved. I mean, in our church, I don't know if some, some people, I don't know if they're truly saved. They will say the right things, but I don't know. But there are other people that I know are saved because I have connection and fellowship with them immediately because you, you love the same Lord. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's key. So the fellowship here is, is something different. It's a different dynamic to have fellowship. So that's why church unity is sometimes a funny thing because you can't have unity with people that aren't saved. You don't have unity. It can, it can be churchy, yeah. but if they're not saved, yeah. you can't. I mean, and this is the difficulty f f generally in our country to go on, because the same thing was mentioned at this church service. It was so scary. Got up and said how thankful they are that uh, they could perform same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we're sitting in this mm -hmm. church, and you talk about that. I sit there and I go, I can't believe this. Mm -hmm. And we should say the same thing about the Church of England now, that are basically saying that a priest can get married to men and if they're men. So now the Church of England saying it's okay for, for priests. Priests? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Just, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it's interesting how it works because the world gets better. Someone told me seven years ago when I came here, I'm very negative. It's going to get better. <laughs> they said to me, uh, coming from South Africa, of course, they said, don't worry about the rainbow stuff. It will be a phase. It will, people will get over it. It will get better. Yeah. Literally two months ago, they voted on uh, blessing same-sex yeah. marriages. Yeah. 
Two months later, now the, the priest can get married to a man or woman. I mean, I mean actually, yeah. Married, yeah, so you can be in a same sex relationship, yeah. married, yeah. and be yeah. a priest. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the public can't yet, the con congregation. Yeah, so you probably have to get. You can only have a blessing. Yeah, you can only have a blessing. So you probably can get married at court. So you can get married at court. Yeah, I, I mean, you can't make the next day. You can't make it. It's the next day. You can't make this up. I mean, it, it, it's. it's, it's Really? The scary thing for me is is that people represent God. Yeah, yeah. You're literally representing God and making these statements. And they put the whole world off Christianity. Of course. I mean, goodness me. I mean, uh, I mean, the Archbishop. No one likes him. No. Not in the church, nor outside the no. church, because I think he's a, he's a comedian outside the church. Yeah. He's not getting he's not getting friends that side they either. They think that's what Christianity that's ridiculous. is. It's ridiculous. So again, the whole dynamic of fellowship here yeah, is the fact that the world's moving more and more to a place where yeah. true fellowship is between those who love the Lord, and that's when you'll know. You're not going to have fellowship just because someone no. goes to church, mm -hmm. and you can force it if you want to, but I don't have time to force it. I'm sorry. I don't have time to force relationships because we have to either have true fellowship no. or you don't. If you sit around trying to force relationships, you're wasting your time. You're not going to do what God's called you to do. And so the world has got this great longing and desire for unity and especially in the yeah. church. But you're not going to have fellowship and unity if there's not a com connection and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just not the way it's going to be. And that's what he writes about so verse 4 goes on to say, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And it's a beautiful little statement there that, that I'm writing this to you that, you that you welled up with joy and that it flows out of you and that it's complete. That's what the full means, that to com complete and to, to basically be um, at, the, at the highest level of blessing of joy because of of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's writing. My verse says, our joy, can it, not your joy. Is there any difference in that? Yeah, there's a little star here in verse 4. Um, so it's probably just a translation thing. I mean, the problem is with yours and ours, and it's a bit of a difficult thing in Greek. So... Um, I mean, it, in it the can... context here, you could actually say both. You can say both. I was thinking, you know, you could make sense of it both ways. Yes. So there's, there's sometimes these I mean, sort of kind kind of preaches. It's like sometimes he says you, but he, then he you sometimes you, you, you stop you yourself. Oh, I'm, you know, and it's yeah. that includes so, as well. It's so, yeah. Yeah. so my translation says yours, your, and and that's probably yeah. the Texas receptors will probably say your, and the the, the, yeah. the, the majority text will say yeah. our. It doesn't really change the content. No, it's not at all. It doesn't. Yeah. Okay, good. And now we're going to get into the real important parts because from verse 5 to 10 <laughs> is now where Christians have struggled. And this is where the wrestling takes place. Not the first five, four verses. That's the easy part. Now, verse 5 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you. So it's very clear that it's a direct message. Paul the Apostle says the same thing. Paul the Apostle says, this I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. Other times Paul says, I say this as a man, or I'm drawing from certain things, which is also under inspiration, but yeah. it wasn't a direct revelation. Yeah. But many things that, that Paul says are direct revelations. And here he's saying, Jesus said this. Now it doesn't mean specifically it's recorded, because we don't find a lot of these things recorded specifically, but this is very direct statement he's making. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And that's very important. And this comes back to the fellowship part. It comes back to the Christian church. That's not controversial, though, is it? Or in terms of... It no, it's not, but, but let's, let's build well, like that. Oh, what does this okay, mean? Yeah, we get it. What does this mean? <laughs> yeah. Because... What does that mean then for the Church of England? Well, God is light, yes. and yes. in Him there's no darkness. No. No. Yeah. Which means there's no compromise with this. No. There's no darkness. Yeah. You can't compromise with any darkness. No. This, he's saying this directly from Jesus Christ. I am light, and in me there is no darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what is the darkness aspect? The darkness aspect is not 
to me person, this might I speak as a man, <laughs> but to me, someone has feelings for another the same sex. That's an issue you need to deal with because the person's yeah. got a problem. Okay, this is not the issue. The issue is not that someone struggles with their sexuality, which can happen. People have been abused. Yeah. I would say I'd say a lot of people have been abused. So that's not the issue. The issue just is that the church is harming people because you're promoting a lifestyle that is absolutely destructive. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Not the fact that we're saying homosexual people can come to church, we want to reach them. That's not the issue to me. That's not, I'm not saying close the doors and anyone that's got a problem can't come to church. That's not what it's, But the issue is it's abuse in a country that is so panicked about safeguarding. What you are doing is you are telling people you can be abused and be in an abusive relationship and things that will abuse you spiritually, abuse you personally and cause major destruction to children, to adults, to whoever. But don't worry, we've got our massive safeguarding signs up in the church when you walk in because we are here to protect vulnerable people. You're destroying people's lives. That's my okay. problem. And not the fact that people can make their own decisions. You are promoting this. And so that's the problem with the darkness here. There is darkness at work. Mm -hmm. Not in the fact that we want to cut people off and not get the gospel to anyone and we want to be judgmental. Not that. But the church should be the ones who declare the light. Mm -hmm. Even though we ourselves are darkness at times, which the text will tell us. I'm not perfect. But... Heaven forbid, I make God as imperfect as I am. God has chosen to use imperfect vessels and broken clay jars to declare the gospel. Don't touch the gospel. It's perfect. You are broken. That's fine. But do not speak for God and make him darkness. That's the problem. That's the problem we're sitting with. That's, our ju that's why I'm judgmental. I'm not judgmental over you personally. I'm judgmental over the... You're making God an accomplice to sin, which is a serious issue. And that's where, where this is this is why it's dangerous. So in the notes, I basically said in John chapter one, we have this, this light. Um, light is very important. I'll put all the verses there. So it's a key point here that, that God is light. And light is manifestation. I want to just quickly just highlight i'm not going to read the specific but highlight john chapter 3 jesus is the light the light has come those who love the light are drawn to the light so their works can be manifest those who hate the light draw away from the light to stay in the darkness because they know their deeds are evil the issue is not people coming to church broken the issue is not people coming to church that are sinful and struggling and they're super skeletons in their closet and in their boots and everywhere I'm talking about the boots and the car, not the shoes. <laughs> but I'm just saying, not that's not the issue here. The issue is when we come here, we're saying, Lord, I need you. That's what we are unified in. We don't come together saying it's okay, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Mm -hmm. I might be struggling with sin. I might not be perfect. I might not be um, sort of morally acceptable to, to some people, mm -hmm. but I'm struggling with this and I'm really, I have a desire to live godly. I do, but I'm struggling. We can all work with that. Yeah. But when we come together and there's this, it's okay yeah. to be sinful mm -hmm. and to be part of things that are super destructive, it's a dangerous thing. Very dangerous. And that's my issue. And it should be an issue for all of us. And it should be something that becomes a really big issue in our country because, unfortunately, the Church of England speaks for the church. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's not a joke. And now it's become a, and again, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this quite candidly to our evangelical mm -hmm. Anglican brothers mm -hmm. who always wanted to tell us, no, it's not going to go there. Mm -hmm. It's just gone there. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. We've been talking about this since 1966. Yeah. Since 1966, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones stood up and said, you've got to yeah. go. And then yeah. people think, oh, no, that's been yeah. too much. Yeah. Yeah. We've been talking about this. And now, and now where are we? Yeah. It's not my worry, yeah. because we're independent. I, I can care less about uh -huh. Steve Chalk and his Baptist buddies. All I'm just saying is that it becomes an issue for the rest of us. Yeah. And, and that darkness has come into the church now. And darkness has come into our country. And not because... 
of people being dark, but the church has become dark. Mm -hmm. That should be more yeah. important to us. But it's also, I mean, obviously it focuses, we focus on in this year, it's quite clear, we can see over the, but it, it's a whole approach to the word here as well, isn't it? Into the God's truth in the word. 100%. Because, because in 100%. the church, you know, I, I mean, I would say, because there's this sort of view, in, even within the church, that, yeah, I don't like the Pauline um, sort of messages, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. about, like, particularly when it comes to the um, men in the church, you know, our roles, yeah, yeah, you know, and just... then where does it where does it go eventually? And it's the same with thing, you, isn't you, it? Eventually, yeah, eventually, eventually, those if you don't comply with God's word, it leads to more and more departing from the right. But it's way also a misunderstanding of the Israel aspect because. When you understand why God gave Israel the law, and I'm not talking specifically about leading them to the Savior, which is the spiritual aspect, well, there was a practical aspect of the law to keep society safe. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Now, as Christians, yeah. we know we're not under the law, no. but the law has a purpose to keep people sure. safe. Yeah. Now, because the Church of England believes the Church has replaced Israel, which is the foundational doctrine, yeah, yeah. that dynamic of the Hebraic understanding of protection because the Anglican Church yeah. doesn't protect a soul. doesn't care. No. Now, that's our responsibility. As a shepherd, you protect the flock and you feed yeah. the flock. The protection is there. But they don't care about protection. And therefore, when you allow wolves in, they will devour the, the, the flock, so to speak. And that's what's happened. And because the Old Testament, when you understand the law and the purpose it played in Israel, I understand that in yeah. the church, there are certain things that are there for our protection. And then we need to understand what it is, not to be a gavel on people, but to say we need to protect situations. Then it's 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 because the church is our free for all, and not understanding the, the purpose of mm. of the calling of the mm. church. Yeah. And so let's move on to verse six. It says, and we now this is where it becomes so so the key is in making the statement. God is light, or Christ is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That's the basic statement. Now, let's look at verse 6, because this is where it gets interesting for us. If we say that we have fellowship with him, immediately, I'm just saying this as a Christian, and hopefully as within our circle of influence as a ministry, you should already know what it's talking about. Because when the word fellowship is used, already you now know. It's dealing with something very specific. Because the word fellowship comes from koinonia, which comes from family, which comes from intimacy. So already you should know that when the term fellowship is used, we are not dealing here with salvation. You should know that immediately when you read it. Because can you be connected to someone and be out of fellowship with them? Of course you can. You can be connected to your children and completely out of fellowship with them, but they're still your children. So already you know. So I don't understand why Christians immediately jump to the worst conclusion. Look now, if there's any darkness in you, you, you're not part of God, you're not saved. That's not what he's saying. Look at what he's saying. He's saying, if we say that we have fellowship with him, that means if I'm walking in intimacy with, with, with God, and then walk in darkness, we lie. You're lying. Because you're not in fellowship with God. And you do not practice the truth because you're lying. And so what he's saying is, if we, as believers, and it's a general term, writing to believers, if we say that we are walking in Christ, and we have fellowship with him, and we actually practice darkness, it's not talking about, oh, I sin here and there. It's talking about walking in darkness. Then what you're doing is you're lying. You're not telling the truth, because you're not in fellowship with him. Because if you were in fellowship with him, you would know what his will is. And therefore, we've got two types of people in the church in general. You've got those who know Christ, they say, but they're out of fellowship with him because they're living not for him. And then you've got those who are in Christ and have fellowship with him because the desire is there to live for him. Those are the two types of people you have. And some people are out of fellowship with God for various reasons. It can be personal, it can be emotional, it can be spiritual, it can be traumatic, whatever it is. But then don't say that I'm, a, I'm you know, if I'm, if I'm struggling with sin and I'm really in a bad place, don't say I'm in fellowship with him. And don't say that I'm, I'm really walking in him because you're not telling the truth. You're not speaking the truth. And, and I mean this, to be honest, if we're not praying, and I'm not talking about religiously now, 
set my clock for six o'clock in the morning and I have to have my prayer time. I'm talking about if you're not praying without mm. ceasing throughout the day, conscious of the Lord, speaking to him, then we're not in fellowship with him. You're not. Mm. Christians can't go a week without praying and then say you're in fellowship with God. He can't be the last thought on your mind. I can't be in a marriage and sort of not speak to Vera for a week and not care. I mean, you can't function like that. And that's the reality. So as a believer, your first thought is I need to spend time with the Lord. The first thought needs I mean, need to be about his word. If that's not happening, then I'm not saying you're not saved, but I'm saying something is wrong. And we need to assess what is wrong. And say, Lord, maybe I've just lost touch with you, and I'm sorry, and come back to that process. Because a continued life of not praying and spending time with the Lord and not being in fellowship with him will lead to serious sin. And I can guarantee this. I don't have specific experience of this with specific, but I can guarantee if someone is out of fellowship with church people, God's people, and they're out of fellowship with the Lord, it's not going to be long before they fall into serious sin. Right, yeah. Because you're out of fellowship with you don't have yeah. anyone that keeps uh, you accountable, encourages you. Uh, and before, you know, six months to a year later, the person come and they come back to church saying, oh, it's been a, I'm sorry, I've, I've you know, it's been a, a yeah. you know, I've, I've fallen, you know, and it's impossible. I'm, I'm talking about younger people yeah. specifically. When you may be, I mean, this respectfully, if you're old and in a certain habit, it becomes different. Makes sense because, yeah. you know, it's life and I do my thing. But if you're young, let's say between 20 and 40, and you're in the world and you're out of fellowship with Christ, it's very dangerous. Maybe when you sort of, let's say, 60 onward and you're sort of more in a routine, you know, you, you'll watch maybe a bit of TV at night and you'll read a book and that's fine. But that's not where young people are at. Young people are, friends are inviting them to the yeah. pub or friends are inviting them there. And if you're out of fellowship... What you're saying is those over 60 and that, they're not going to, maybe they might not fall into serious sin, but what you're saying... Physical is, sin. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're still not like, because what, what are they living for? I mean, that's the whole thing, isn't because it? Because all like, of us, I mean, even when you're married, right. you get into a certain routine at times. I'm just saying about the realities of people yeah. that fall into sin generally in church... Right. In a certain age bracket where there are a lot of temptations, right. and if you're not keeping in fellowship, it's more dangerous. For you. And therefore, he's yeah. writing you saying that if you are yeah. saying that I have fellowship with God and I'm walking in it, but you're walking in darkness, you, you, you don't practice. Look at this. We lie and do not. So there's key words. Fellowship and practice. Did you know that? It's not rocket science. Fellowship is closeness, it's atonement, not Passover, it's atonement. And atonement was to bring you in, to bring you close, and then practice the truth. He's talking about living out your salvation with fear and trembling. So you're not living out your salvation because you're not practicing the truth. It's got nothing to do with what happens in the heart per se. It's got to do with the external. And that's where some Christians struggle. Because we're not in fellowship with God. It's part, it happens. It, it happens so subtly. I think it happened yeah. to me in the ministry for, for, for several years where I was just doing church stuff, but I was out of fellowship with God. Not doing anything super no. wrong, but I just got into a mode of just preparing sermons, preaching sermons, doing all these things, but just not taking notice of where I'm at with no. the Lord because no one was encouraging and challenging no. on these things. And I can look back and it just really strikes me hard because you're praying just you know, it's nonsense prayers. I was basically wasting my breath. Right. Reading the Bible for what? Yeah, yeah. And you have to be more in tune. Say, Lord, and this is the same with marriage. If you're not in tune with your marriage, you are in big trouble. Because it's very possible before you know it, you are nautically yeah. far away from each other because you haven't been in tune. So in our spiritual life, it's very important to be in tune with the Lord. Yeah. And so... That's important. So this is what he's talking about. He's talking about practice here. Let's look at verse 7. But if we walk, now I'm, again, I'm, I'm just trying to help you because I cannot deal with Christians who use this and make people panic. We have the word fellowship. You have the word practice. And now you've got the word walk, yeah. which should tell you it's sanctification we're dealing with here. We're not dealing with justification. It's there, right in front of us. Yeah, I think some of the problem with these words is it's this word if. And that's a difficult word in English. It is. Because it's a word which is a, con like, uh, a conditional word. Exactly. And that's why I think my uh, father-in-law's got a book, God's an Englishman. And I'm just glad that he's not. Because <laughs> if, yeah. if, if it's just a dangerous word, you're spot on. Because you have to get away from that because doctrine overrides words. 
we should know the general doctrine now. Therefore, when I read if, I need to read the context, and then if's not going to turn. But if I'm a verse person, well, I just take this verse and I take that verse, and then words become very important, then it becomes a dangerous yeah. thing. So that's why it's in, the, the overarching doctrine always determines what the what what is being said. So yeah, but if is hundred percent a, a dangerous word. Because in English, it's a, it's a different yeah, word. Different Even Afrikaans, when you read Afrikaans, the Afrikaans yeah. language is written so, Afrikaans is so direct, it's very similar to German. It's so direct yeah. that when you read it, it almost sounds like God shouting at yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And, and then that's, people build God then in the telling image, you off, telling, you telling you off. Because the Afrikaans language is like that. Like, right. like if you shout at someone in Afrikaans, they know exactly what you're saying in a very yeah. direct way. Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 yeah, yeah. like it's because it's so direct. Yeah, I know. I mean, I spoke to someone, I think I, I think I chatted to Kenny when we drove like a potato. We talked about a potato. In Afrikaans, a potato is an earth apple. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. It's very, very direct. It's from the yeah. earth and yeah. it looks like yeah. an apple. So I'm just saying that, that language is, yeah. is very, very dangerous and doctrine is more important than language. Yeah. So we have to know God's character and that becomes maybe the issue for Wycliffe Bible Translate. Mm -hmm. Because you're translating in the language oh, of the people, but you don't yeah. teach them doctrine. No. And therefore, some things could be lost in translation. Yeah. We yeah. have to teach God's character, mm. which is the most important part. And therefore, verse 7 is, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. This is key. True fellowship can only happen in the light. Mm. And how is this? Is this because we don't sin? No. Because what's so beautiful is if God's people walk in the light, they will still sin, but they'll be... Those who acknowledge their sin and shortcoming. Make sense? Yeah. Because I'm walking in the light. I don't mind the light being manifested on my shortcomings. Because if it, oh, I'm sorry, I made yeah. mistakes, I'm wrong, I'm repentant, let's move on because the light has been shone on yeah. my. I've got no problem yeah. if I'm wrong. But when I do have a problem, is when I'm hiding like a cockroach in the dark. So in fellowship, it is basically we walk, and what we do is we walk in the light. We're happy to manifest in the light together because we're repentant as God's people together. So if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And this is the key one. This, this is so profound. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The word cleanse there is used ceremonially. That's what the word is in Greek. As soon as you know, sort of read ceremonially, it takes us back to something very specific. And it takes us back to the Day of Atonement. It's not about salvation. Israel would come. The people would be saved. But they would still come for the Day of Atonement because that's when fellowship happens. The cleansing year is not initial cleansing, forgiving your sin. The cleansing year is daily sanctification. That if we walk in the light, right. we have fellowship with each other, we are repentant, we are walking sanctified lives. And so the blood then acts as a constant cleansing, like what the priest would do when he walks into the temple or the tabernacle. He takes the water from the labor. He sprinkles himself. That is cleansing because of the ash of the heifer. It's a ceremonial process of daily being cleansed. When you pray, when you repent, which we're going to deal with in verse 9, of course, it's a daily process of being sanctified. Not about initial forgiveness of sin. We know that Jesus has saved us and forgiven our sin and our sin is separated as far as the east is from the west mm -hmm. but daily we want to be open and cleansed and ready for the day and living sanctified lives not <laughs> and so the principle here is walking in light fellowship with one another and then the cleansing happens together and personally in a sanctified life that wants to live for Christ yeah. the use of the word walk is quite different pleasure moving through life Yes, mm. which is sanctification. Being in the light. Sorry? Oh, being in the light. It's, it's good. If we are in the light, we're walking in the light. It's right now moving, moving, moving forward. Yes, moving forward, but it's, it's, it's a Christian walk. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's a Christian can be a Christian and walk in darkness. Mm. Depends on where you're walking. Mm. So he's saying walk in the light. That means it's part of your sanctification. Some Christians are saved but not living sanctified lives. So some priests would go, but not put the, the water on them as they enter into the temple. So they're walking into the temple unsanctified because they're not acknowledging 
Because the water doesn't cleanse you. It's a sprinkling. Come on. But it's the acknowledgement of my need for God, which is what we're going to get to in verse 9. That's what sanctification is. Mm -hmm. Daily I'm on my knees. I acknowledge my need. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge my need for sanctification. And if we don't have that thinking, then what happens, we get to the place where we think we live the Christian life on our own steam. And when you think that, you're in a very bad place because that is the worst place we can be. Because then we're like the tax collector that says, I'm not, I'm not like yeah. you. Know. So we, the, the cleansing here ceremonially, daily, it's a process of cleansing, which we're very grateful for. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So it's not dealing here with sin. It's about walking, as Keith said, walking, moving forward in the light, because it's possible to walk in darkness. So the person that walks in light acknowledges their sin. The person that is in darkness often doesn't acknowledge their sin. That's the difference. Not about the sin aspect. It's what you acknowledge. Because to acknowledge God, acknowledge your need for him, acknowledge that your need for the light is part of the sanctification process. Christianity is not about perfect people. It's about repentant people. People that rely upon God. Their need for God is your strength. Not, not reaching a level where I don't need him anymore. Now I'm sort of super perfect and holy. The whole point of being a great Christian is your acknowledge, acknowledgement of him. And this is why I believe many ministers in the past have struggled. Because we look at the, some of the great pastors and preachers. What happens with pastors they think they get to a level where you've, mm. you've reached a level now. Because it's also the expectation of the people that the pastor's on this level. All of us are in exactly the same place. Mm. We have to acknowledge our shortcomings, acknowledge our sin, acknowledge our need for God every single day. Look at Moses' life. Moses needed to acknowledge that because Moses wasn't perfect. He lost his temper. He hit the rock. Abraham, I mean, all of, yeah. I don't understand where these perfect people are. Even Paul the Apostle writes and says, I'm struggling in prison, yeah. Haste, <laughs> haste to come to me. Because he feels alone. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't get this, this picture that we sometimes have. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So John is saying, he's writing about sanctification, walking in the light, because all of us have to acknowledge we are in sin. We, we sin. Mm. And the truth is not in us if we don't acknowledge our sin. And then verse 9, it says, if we confess our sin. So if you acknowledge your sin, well, what comes with it must be confession. Because the irony is how often I've heard in many church services, preachers who preach and say, and I've seen them before. You know, we're all sinners. And everyone acknowledges it in the congregation. He says, we're all sinners. And then I spend time with them and I realize they don't think they're sinners. I've met many ministers who don't believe they sin. Because they never acknowledge their mistake. Have you ever met a minister? If you find a minister who acknowledges their mistakes, you've done well. Because I don't know them. Because many ministers don't like to acknowledge their mistakes. They always do what's right, and they always portray this image of doing what's, what's right. And it, 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 that just is a funny thing with ministers, because we all say, oh, no, we're all sinners, but we don't really yeah. acknowledge it. Yeah. So if, verse 8 says, if we say that we have sinned, we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves. So if we acknowledge our sin and we know we are sinners, what we must do is daily then confess our sins. Not so. Mm -hmm. But what are they in your life? What are they in my life? Because you know what? Lord, please forgive my sin. It's not a valid prayer. I'm sorry. God goes, oh. <laughs> God just goes, oh, goodness. Oh, okay, it's nice you've prayed. You know what they are? Can you list them? Can we list our shortcomings in those areas? Oh, Lord, this week again, I fell into the trap of yeah. doing that thing that I know I shouldn't, that thing. Someone got under my skin and I reacted in that way, or I did yeah. this, or I did. What about those things? Those are the things that God's interested in. Will you actually acknowledge that moment, that thing? What are those? I don't know what they are in your life. Yeah. I know what they are in mine. But just to pray blanket prayers of, Lord, please forgive me, doesn't mean anything. What is it that God needs to deal with? And that is the process where you start acknowledging and God can start dealing with it. God can't deal with something. So you heard the statement, if you aim at nothing, you always hit the target. <laughs> Unless you basically are honest with things, how can God help you with the very thing that you're not going to praise him for because you're not, you're not acknowledging what it is? And so here he's saying, if we confess our sins, which is part of verse 8, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The forgiveness there is the personal aspect of this. He's not dealing with a cross here. 
Mm. Please don't see it like that. Oh, no, so God's not going to forgive you. He's already forgiven you. But it's talking about the personal fellowship dynamic. The same as, you know, I use Mary's example with Vera. Sometimes I do things. Does she stop loving me because I, you know, leave the towel on the floor sometimes or whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. Not that I do that, but there's other stuff I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm just using an example. Um, is she not? not no. But you know what happens? I need to actually say I'm sorry. And then she'll forgive me for leaving the towel on the yeah. floor. But it's because it restores fellowship. Yeah. So the forgiveness, yes, about that personal time. Lord, I'm sorry I have done this in your sight. Look at David. Look throughout the Psalms when David yeah. writes. David acknowledges specifically, oh, I've done this, I've done that. And so the forgiveness there is personal. So if someone comes to this verse and say, well, unless people are very confessional, then God's not going to forgive them. They're missing the complete context of what it's saying. So I'm sorry. I'm not going to fly for that one because that is just the twisting of Scripture. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. There comes the cleansing and sanctify us from all unrighteousness. How does he, how can, so does it mean that God takes away all your unrighteousness? Because that would contradict verse 8, wouldn't it? But mm. cleansing here has got nothing to do with take away. Cleansing here is to give you that renewal. Makes sense. Mm. To move forward. It's the past now. Let's move forward. So it's all got to do with that. So that's why the word cleansing here cannot be the same as the cross. Because then it means unrighteousness is gone and you've got no unrighteousness anymore. It doesn't make sense because it contradicts scripture. But it's talking about that renewal. We start again. We move forward. And verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And that's very strong. Because that's true. I think that's when we start. You can actually question if someone is a believer if they don't believe that they are sinners. So how do you know? mm -hmm. I need a savior? If you don't believe you're a sinner. Yeah. So, it's, it's again, it, it's key words here. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Now, in conclusion, as we look at sort of application here before we conclude, is what I would want to do is, how do we make, because again, these verses must be real to us as a church and as God's people. The reason why is that, how do we put, we should put this in practice a bit more. Makes sense. Which means we should forgive each other. Also ask for forgiveness and for, be forgiving. This is what makes a fellowship strong. A strong fellowship is not a holy one. A strong fellowship one is a repentant one. Mm. Makes sense. And let's get away from this picture of holiness. Yeah. Goodness, it doesn't exist. The Puritans didn't survive, did they? They really thought that they are going to survive. You can't survive on external holiness. It doesn't work. We work on internal holiness that then manifests itself outwardly. But it starts from the inside. It starts with acknowledging God being repentant, um, living sanctified lives, and he's going to the source to get the cleansing daily to walk the walk. Let's, let's do that. That makes us strong as believers. Instead of this church that creates this atmosphere of everyone's on this massive level of super holiness, which doesn't exist. It's fake. It doesn't exist in any fellowship. And I know it because if you do a little bit of digging to all the big churches you've known, there are skeletons that come out of every single closet. Because you, because people fail and stumble and fall yeah. and make mistakes. So what we need to do is just be repentant as people. I trust that this will actually be some, something we can put into action. Okay. We're going to close in prayer and then leave it to questions before we conclude. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this very important passage of scripture. And we pray, Lord, that we'll truly put it in action by focusing our hearts on you, walking in the light. And then also, Lord, being repentant and being honest about our, our shortcomings, Lord. And we just pray that you help us to, to walk in you faithfully, Lord. And we just thank you for your word and your truth to us today. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.